Welcome to Lethal Dose, your favorite toxicology-focused podcast where we delve into true crime cases involving drugs and poisons. My name is Venus Dineko. I'm a layperson fascinated by true crime. My name is Kayla Woods. I'm an author and toxicologist. Let's get started. Today, we are putting chloroform under the microscope, but when and where are you taking us, Kayla? I am taking us to 1915. Trench warfare is being fought in World War I, and Typhoid Mary has just left the sanatorium and found work as a cook in New York City, which was against <laughs> her agreement. <laughs> I know where amazed. we are now. <laughs> Excellent. Yep, but more poopy peaches. <laughs> Between September 1914 and January 1915, 17 people passed away in the German Odd Fellows home, a nursing home which was the residence of orphaned children and elderly men and women. This was an unusually high death rate for the home, and the administration suspected foul play and informed the police. Soon after, an Austrian immigrant willingly surrendered himself to the district attorney's office, admitting that he was a killer of eight octogenarians in the home. Oh. Frederick Moores started as an orderly at the German Oddfellows home in Yonkers in 1914, shortly after first coming to America. According to his statement to the police, he was quickly basically made a nurse, and then after that was approached by the superintendent and asked to, quote, help with the removal of certain sick and expensive patients. Excuse me. <laughs> Moores understood the assignment, and although he wasn't given more explicit instruction than that, he decided himself that poison was probably the more kind-hearted way to go about it, and he also knew that it could slip easily under the radar in 1914 New York. These are some very, very big accusations he's making, though, because while he did come forward himself on his own volition and say, hey, killed uh, some old people, approximately eight, <laughs> and I am being kind and I poisoned them. But like saying that it was a part of some bigger conspiracy with the nursing home, I'm interested to find out if this is true or not. Oh, we'll get to it. We'll yeah. definitely get to it. Okay. So the first poison that Moore's tried was arsenic because arsenic was available as a medicinal remedy. And so he was actually able to get it at the nursing home. But rather than slipping peacefully away, as Moore's said he intended, the patient was horribly sick and developed a creeping paralysis in his body that lasted for four days before he died. That sentence just horrifies me to have, have to have written, like, a creeping paralysis and then you die? Yeah, this isn't a slow or, like, a peaceful, nice trip to the other side. It's agonizing torture, <laughs> As you have informed us over uh, a couple of hours now through two parts about heavy hitter arsenic, we have learned this isn't a fun way to die. This no. is one of the worst. Morris told the police that he was on constant exhausting nursing duty the whole time because oh. poor him for having poor to take care Morris. of the guy he poisoned. No. No. And that the whole experience was horrible for both him and the patient whose name he couldn't even remember. <sighs> Which, like, I get that, like, when you work in in close to death with death, you don't remember every name and story. But when it's a living sure. person to begin with, I feel like there's a bit more, you know? Well, yeah. And, and especially if he had this big air quotes, guys, traumatic experience, yeah, right? <laughs> right? Don't you think that he would remember? Like, I don't know. That's just, that's cold and callous. Yeah. I, I feel yeah. like if I was working with somebody and then killed them and they were the first person mm -hmm. that I never killed, I might remember that. Right? Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, this is not, I mean, a lot of this is not normal, but this yeah. is even <laughs> more cold than some that, you know, some others. Yeah. He abandons arsenic. He says that was no good. And then he For goes, his own reasons, though. <laughs> Right. And then he goes and searches something else in the dispensary of the home. His next patient and all the rest to follow were killed with chloroform. The reason that the home had chloroform on hand is because it was used as a sedative in 1915, and it had been used as such for less than a century, actually. It was a pretty new medicine. Mm. 
Chloroform was first synthesized in the mid-19th century, and then after it was synthesized and it was used as a solvent, its use as an anesthetic on test animals was soon exploited as an alternative to mixing acetone and benzene, which I guess was what they did with test animals. Mm. And I understand why they did this, because acetone is nail polish remover, so right. everybody is probably familiar with the smell of that. Benzene is the smell that you smell on gasoline. Mm, and okay. benzene is no longer in gasoline, but it was at one point. And so basically you were just using this vaporized anesthesia of nail polish remover and gasoline. That's no fun for anybody. Whereas chloroform actually smells cloyingly sweet. Mm, that's a really specific way to describe it. Yeah, it's a very sweet smell. Mm -hmm. And so I could see why that would be preferable. I mean, and I don't mind the smell of gasoline, but mm. on top of other chemical smells, that's a little much. Yeah. Do we know how chloroform came to be? Like, was this chemist working on something intentional, like trying to achieve what chloroform became, or was it an accidental discovery? I'm not sure. I know that he came about it by missing trichloroacetic acid and ammonia. And okay. so it, it kind of just does sound like that mid-19th century thing where maybe they needed a new solvent. Because I've used a lot of chloroform in my experiences in laboratories. I used a lot of chloroform at the coroner's office. like, And it was mostly used as a solvent, like to clean, essentially? Not, not to clean, to separate. So it was oh, an extractive solvent. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if they were looking for something that they were like, we need to extract... My research has shown me that, like, we did a lot of extracting from things that were already okay. pretty chemical heavy and maybe had a lot of, like, different partitions that you could take from it. So maybe they were looking for something that they were like, we just want this partition and we can't mm. quite find the solvent that gets us that. So gotcha. it may have been that. He may have just been one of those chemists who was like, it's never been done before and if I can, <laughs> if I can do it, cool. Right. Cool, cool for me. Okay. So I'm not exactly sure what was going on there, but this is very like chemistry in the mid 19th century. Like yeah, I'm just, just mixing shit mix together. That's well, and that's why I, I ask because I've learned of that from other episodes. Like yes. sometimes things just happen and then look like Viagra, for example, they weren't trying to make Viagra. Mm -hmm. Like it just happened, you know, <laughs> like an unintended solution to a problem. Penicillin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So it was used on test animals as an alternative to that acetone-benzene mixture, but it was first used on humans in 1847. And if you do any looking into chloroform, this is like when they make it sound like chloroform first came on the scene, and it's like, no, it's been here for a while, actually. Okay. In 1847, this physician named James Young Simpson, he's like okay. the guy, even though it had been around for a while. He was the one who really like made a name for it. Yeah, because he introduced it to human medicine because he was mm. supposedly, according to the story, searching out an anesthetic that made childbirth go easier than using ether because oh. that's what we were using as an anesthetic then was ether, which was preferred but was dangerous, wasn't very fast acting. So, so after ether, then came chloroform. Got it. And so soon after, he was like, look, I'm using it in childbirth. It found its way into surgical theaters. But as medicine was in the mid-19th century with snake oils and apothecaries, chloroform then found its way into over-the-counter sleep aids, cough syrups, alcoholic DTs, and as an antiemetic, which I find funny because hmm. I don't think chloroform will help you with anti no, no, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it sounds very much during this era, yes. like we have this new thing that we can put in our bodies, guys. Yeah. Let's use it for everything. <laughs> like, like, I mean, listeners will remember, like they were using arsenic as medicine, you yep. know, just like, that's why they had it in this situation. Yeah. <laughs> like that's just what they did in this time in history. It's just what they did. Right. And that's, and I'm very much living for instances like this that really bring our tagline, the dose makes the poison. Mm -hmm. I get it. This is it. <laughs> this is it. And, and I also just love like the medicinal right to poison. I always love learning how narrow that window is. Oh, it's so narrow. <laughs> yeah. It's so bad. <laughs> So when did chloroform start to become important or more well-known? Right around then when it was being used as an anesthetic, it was or, like, this is important. I guess, when did we first see trouble? Oh, 
also in immediately. <laughs> okay, there it is. There it is. Yeah, as soon as it was in the surgical theaters and after Simpson was like, hey, have you heard of this solvent <laughs> that you can put on a rag and then put it on someone's face? About one in 3,000 patients in surgery died. And they saw that pretty immediately. That's not a small number. And it, it acted very quickly, too. I said that it acted quicker than either. Yeah. Some of the people who died after chloroform was administered for surgery died before the first incision was even made. It was very quick. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. That is scary. Yeah. So what happened then? What did they do? Well, so they did start looking into it. They did have these discussions in journals where they were like, you know, it's hard to dose out something that you just pour on a rag. Oh, so that's literally what they did. So it's like a fucking burglar. Yeah. <laughs> I I was envisioning that this was like an IV situation. Oh, ooh, ooh, no, no, no. Ooh, no. no. Okay. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, when I hear that it's used in a medicinal setting, I like no. automatically assume like, so it's they more were like straight up just like coming from, <laughs> yeah, from well, behind and like <laughs> well they were usually over sleeping. you like you're going to sleep now it was a little right. bit nicer than the burglar situation <laughs> right but... but they're like go to sleep and yeah. then it happened well and the way that that it developed is like now if you were to go into surgery we certainly we have things that are administered in IV but we also sometimes have gas that were given and right. so, so they, it'd be more like that than... they started to change it up there's another guy john snow not of game of thrones but john snow who is famous for his work in chloroform he actually describes creating something like that that goes over your face so that you could dose it you could be like i'm gonna put a milliliter or however many grains is probably how they measured it then i'm gonna put so many grains in here and if they don't go out so many grains more and it's super volatile okay and so it'll just become the vapor in the mask Gotcha. But they had to get to that point of being like, hey, we don't dose very well when we just pour it on the rag. Right. And it was really hard to tell when a dosage would kill somebody because a third of an ounce was known to be fatal, but there were also chronic chloroform addicts who could take an entire quart before they died. Kind of reminds me about ketamine where it's like you kind of just don't know what's going to happen to mm -hmm. somebody when you introduce it to their system. Like, and with ketamine, oftentimes they don't know when it's applied in that setting. This even, who knows how chloroform is going to act on them? You right. know what I'm saying? Like, it's not like you check it on a box before surgery. They probably yeah. didn't even have pre-surgery questionnaires I, back then. They were probably giving you brandy before surgery and like, right, that's a right. big no-no. Like, so, but let's for a second assume you don't live to tell the tale of... Right. I die when given chloroform in right. any amount. Well, and it's like that with a lot of anesthesia, which, like we said in the ketamine episode, is why anesthesiologists are paid the big bucks because, like, right. you have to be on top of it. And chloroform acted very quickly. It was very right. hard to be on top of it. Well, and of. that's, yeah, it sounds like if it had that effect, the anesthesiologist doesn't even have a chance to act upon it. It's like, oh, they're dead. Mm -hmm. That's problematic. Chloroform addicts, though, can we rewind a little bit there? If there's a substance, people will be addicted to it. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. I mean, just like there were arsenic addicts, like yep, there. Are, yeah, and okay. chloroform addicts, okay. I think they did like the sedative feeling. I imagine because I have smelt mm, chloroform. Makes, I could see that. I could see that. Yeah, and I imagine that it's maybe not as much of a high. Like I don't think it's binding to anything. That's like, ooh, I feel good. I think it's more like huffing probably okay where you're just killing brain cells yeah for that immediate experience yeah i've never done it i had friends who did that too much don't huff kids yeah don't huff don't huff it's not a good idea <laughs> it literally just kills brain cells you're not getting high you're just yeah. dying yeah don't do it <laughs> yeah it's bad news any type <laughs> Okay, cool. But, Glad we so, had this talk. Right. This is how Moores was able to kill people in 1915 and go almost completely unnoticed because he didn't have to take very much and people mm. just slipped away and fell asleep. And if they were old, which all of his patients, it seems like, were, right. they just went to bed, went to sleep and died. I don't want to say it's the perfect crime because it's not. It's not. It's definitely not. It's definitely not. But I understand... I can understand how during this time in the early 1900s, how it went. But I mean, he still had to like figure it out because he made mistakes a couple of times, which oh, makes sense okay. well, because it, he was just an orderly. He wasn't in any way educated about how to oh. do it properly. And so he didn't know the ways that you could hurt 
somebody that could come around and bite you in the ass if you're trying to kill people discreetly. Yeah, I I forget that he just kind of got thrown into that position. Like, he was just like, oh, here's here's the keys. So with with one man, he accidentally used too much chloroform on the rag, and it left caustic red burns around the mouth. Okay, that's going to cause some questions to come up. Well, the embalmer who regularly prepared bodies for the Odd Fellows home actually asked about the red marks. And I guess it, it was an exchange he was having with Moore's. Like, Moore's oh. kills him and he's like, oh, no, this patient died. I guess I'll take him to the funeral home to the embalmer. And so, right. you know, he takes the patient there and the embalmer's like, these red marks, did this guy die in surgery? Because these red marks look like deaths that I've seen from chloroform, from chloroform in surgeries. Sur- like, right. the embalmer recognized what they were. And Moore's said something about, like, putting a rag on the man's mouth to, like, keep it shut. And the embalmer was like, that doesn't sound right, but I'm not going to question it any more than that. And just, like, dropped it. It was enough to scare Moore's to be like, okay, I'm not doing this in, like, a very discreet way. Right. After that, he started putting Vaseline around the mouth of the victim so that there were no cost of grud marks. But then... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, oh good okay well, an- another orderly was like why is there vaseline on this guy's face like this is weird then morris right. was like oh because vaseline will make it easier to shave the corpse and the orderly mm. thought this was really weird because the guy because was it still is. alive Be- when they were having this conversation wait whoa <laughs> what we're not even talking about like okay i have so many fucking questions what in the actual fuck okay so why would it even make sense to have Vaseline? Why is Moore's the one, like, he's not embalming. He's not going to be doing the shaving. So why is he like, look, I prepped this person for you to be shaved. That's my first question. <laughs> Meanwhile, the guy with the Vaseline is like, I'm not I'm dead not yet. Dead yet. <laughs> yes. And that, that is very, very troubling. And, and even more troubling is, this is reminding me of the Bradford sweets poisoning where there are just so many things along the way. Yeah. That yeah. could, do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. It, like I'm it was a crazy time to be alive back then when you're just like, yes. that seems odd. None of my oh, well. business though. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, and meanwhile, there is drama on like the next door app where every Karen and their mom is playing detective about whose dog is pooping on their yard. It was a simpler time. <laughs> time. But uh, seriously though, this is incredibly Yeah, like what the fuck? <laughs> what what in the actual fuck? Okay. Yeah. All right. So did this guy end up dying? I'm unsure. I think he did, but I'm unsure. But we don't know for certain. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know that he kept doing this Vaseline thing, right. but after this encounter where the orderly was like this guy's not dead yet. Yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> like, they're letting him do nurse shit when he doesn't even know if somebody's alive or dead. <laughs> well, that's what? what it looks like. That's what it looks like is you don't even know what a patient is alive or dead. Right, Meanwhile, but... he's like, well, he was going to be dead, but you kind of interrupted what we had going on here. <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> Leave <Yeah>. me alone. <laughs> <laughs> so... This encounter scared Moores again. He was like, oh shit, I'm going to get caught. I should have got caught then. And so he started changing his method to taking cotton wool, soaking it in chloroform, and then shoving it in the victim's nose. <gasps> mm-hmm. Oh, ow. Mm, yeah. That, that's, there's like a sadism component there almost. Yeah. Yeah, I like, think so. Like, I'm not a criminal psychologist. Any thoughts, opinions expressed here are not... But, you know, that's not okay. Well, it gets worse than that because no. he he would plug the nose. I think he would also plug the ears maybe even. Like, this guy was very weird and didn't want any of the vapor escaping. And then he would pour chloroform down the mouth <gasps> of the victim no. to, like, ensure death and would close the mouth and keep it shut to, like, that's... keep the vapors in. But it just sounds like overkill. That's the exact word that I was going to use. Yeah. it's It's overkill because, mm-hmm. like... I can understand if I were a killer evolving from, oh, this left burns on their mouth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change. I can understand that progression, Mm -hmm. but this is getting sick. Yeah. Like this is getting a little much, my guy. You're too much, Gene. It's too much right now. 
does plugging the ears like to me that wouldn't make sense but no. I'm I learned something new every fucking day on this show so I, it wouldn't matter it wouldn't matter because the vapor can't escape through your ears right. your okay. ears aren't a hold right. of your so, brain so I'm just making sure that that is the case this man probably shouldn't have been an orderly if he thinks that that's a thing he certainly doesn't understand how the vapors work there's yes. just a lot that I'm finding icky with this one yeah and Moore's he was trying to cover up the sadism that you have caught on to. He was trying to tell the police, at least, that he was trying to give his victims a peaceful death. He only killed the very sick and the old ones who were already going to die, quote unquote. We're all going to die. <laughs> right, right. Moors. Then he would also say, you know, it was to make room for more inmates, which is like, this is, the whole system is broken and you're, you're a broken ass cog in it. Yes. But the surviving patients had a very different version of Morse when the police came investigating. Oh, yeah. I mean, I keep forgetting, I guess, that he went in and was like, yeah, so yeah. I did this stuff. There was a 14-year-old girl who worked in the home's medical dispensary, and she told the police that she'd heard Morse comment on the uselessness of the residents and that Morse <laughs> directly told her it would be, quote, a good thing to get rid of a few of them. And the embalmer, who... Morse has already like had mm -hmm. encounters with right. thought that Morse was competent but cold and indifferent to the suffering of patients which the embalmer may have written off as just that's how you get through your work day sure. but he also did note it and so it's like is it something said after the fact that actually was a curiosity to stand out or right like who knows who knows if they used those words like competent and cold quote unquote like that's something that you think about somebody you right. know what I mean? Like, yeah. that sounds like a preformed opinion. And it sounds accurate. I mean, when we're bringing up the usefulness of a right. resident in an old, put, like, it doesn't get more cold than that? I don't know. Yeah. The patients also told the police that Moores threatened some of them if he found them difficult. And he would say, if you don't stop making so much trouble, I'll send you to where there's more heat than you want. There were also claims that Morris dressed in a white coat with a stethoscope around his neck after he was given basically the position of nurse. He decided to upgrade himself to doctor, and he actually made the residents refer to him as Herr Doctor, which just is a, is a German formality of being like, you're a literal fucking doctor. Right, right. And, and this is just like, I'm cosplaying as a doctor. Yes. Like, this yes. is screaming, I'm cosplaying as a doctor, which reminds me of this kid named Malachi Robinson, who literally did this. I will post definitely in Discord, I'll make myself a note right now, but there's this kid who basically put on the coat and the stethoscope, oh, no. and he literally got away with it, and then he got in trouble, and then he did it again in a different way. It's happened more than once, and my favorite YouTube creators have done a bunch of stories about him. So I will share those with you all. That's the vibe I'm getting is that he just put on the coat and the right. stethoscope and said, I'm a doctor. Yeah. Please call me doctor. <laughs> Shit. That's crazy. Yeah. How the fuck does that happen when an orderly does this? Well, maybe the other orderlies were also just like, yeah, shut the fuck up. They didn't give a fuck. Yeah. We, we I don't care. Yeah. But like, it sounds like the really problematic, quote unquote, problematic residents, Moore's got rid of because there was another another story that was told to the police that there was a, a woman who kept ringing a bell to get somebody to help mm. her. And it was mm -hmm. Moore's who was there at the time. And he threatened her that if she summoned him again, she would be sorry. And she continued to summon him with her bell. And the next day she was dead. So it could just be that it's if you were a problem, if you said something, right. you're, you're out of here. This is also escalating from the hospital told me that we need to make room for people to, I'm pissed off at you because you need help in a nursing home. Right. But the police also, when they were doing their investigation, they mm -hmm. were like, okay, this seems callous. But then they did see more that made them believe that he was just following orders and this was the way the nursing Real home was run. Okay. Yeah. So this, it, like, there might be a conspiracy? Take the tinfoil hat off. It's real. <laughs> there was another orderly who, when the police were talking to everyone, he said that he walked in on Moores and the superintendent at the home talking over a corpse. And when oh. the orderly walked in, he thought there was a sweet chemical smell in the air. Oh. And he was like, what is that smell? And Moores opened the window and then the superintendent lit a cigar. So the, the room smelled like, you know, nicotine. Yeah, that's... That's not subtle, first of all. 
but suspicious fuck. Right. But he was being, like, supported by the superintendent until the investigation started when the administration Mm. was like, a lot of people are dying. And then Moores thought that the superintendent was going to, you know, send him down the river. And so he decided to beat him to it and was like, I did it, but also I was told to do it. And so they think that that was what happened. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. I I heard most of this story in a book by one of my favorite authors called The Poisoner's Handbook by Deborah Blum, and she describes in it more of the, like, politics behind it because, like, the coroners at the time in New York were not very good, and there was just a lot of, like, people coming in with gunshot wounds to the back that were called, like, Mm. accidents or suicides and, and shit like that. Sure, 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 sure. And so she describes how Moores was declared a criminal lunatic and was put under observation at the Bellevue Hospital. Mm. And Bellevue didn't think that Moores was certifiably insane. Like, he couldn't claim that. I don't think so. But the Bronx DA disagreed, and they didn't have any firsthand accounts or eyewitnesses to the Mm. murders. They just had kind of circumstantial evidence. Mm -hmm. And they were pretty sure that the superintendent was going to say, like, Moore's did this on his own. I had nothing to do with it. I don't know. And so they were trying to find a way to ensure that Moore's would get incarcerated without having to go through a trial that they didn't have enough evidence for. Gotcha. So if everybody wants to go through the politics of that, definitely read her book. But... The gist of it is that the DA decided kind of on their own to commit Morris to an insane asylum. And then while he was there, they were going to work on deporting him back to Austria. Oh, okay. And that's how they were going to deal with him. Okay. So he was sent to the Hudson River State Hospital for the insane in Poughkeepsie. Moores was there for three months before he learned he was going to be deported, and then a week before his transfer in May of 1915, Moores escaped the hospital and was never seen again. No! He just walked away. (laughs) Are you fucking kidding? No, because it was 1915, and you could just put an ID on a dead body and be like, I'm dead now, and I'm a different person. Wow. I was not ready for that one. Wasn't ready. (laughs) Wasn't ready. So it is believed he took on a new identity as Frederick Maurice Benno, and he worked in the first aid department of Turner and Seymour Company in Torrington, Connecticut. Oh, he wanted to continue cosplaying as somebody who cares for people. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And as Benno, he was drafted into World War I using the same birthday as Frederick Moores, and so it's a lot of, like, documentation that they, like, okay. came to this conclusion with. And they found three letters that he wrote. I'm not sure who he wrote them to, but he admitted to killing eight people in New York, this Frederick Benno guy did. Mm. And he left a suicide note in April of 1918, and then Benno was never heard from again. Hmm. In May of 1923... Skeletal remains were found near bottles of poison. I'm unsure what poison. Okay. And the body was identified by the shoes and teeth to probably be Moore's. Okay. So that's wow. the end of Moore's. Damn. Not the ending that I would have hoped for. Right. He just got away. He was never tried. He wasn't yeah. held anywhere. He just went on to live his life and then killed himself, apparently. Yeah. Question mark. Yeah. And I mean... Killing eight people might fuck with uh, your conscience a little. I don't know. I'll put my tinfoil hat back on. What if it wasn't him? What if Moores wasn't the person who killed? Or what no. if Benno wasn't what if the that, person? What if, the, well, yeah. What if Benno wasn't the person? Or what if that body wasn't his? And he I, lived this, like, you know? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Because it was the 19, early 1900s. You could do anything back then. You could do, you could, <laughs> you could do a lot more. You could do a lot more. What a time. Do we know if he documented anything about his victims? Like, do we have names or anything for any of them? I or... think that the, the, the home actually had the documentation. And so they had 17 people who died. And perhaps it was just that the other nine were people who maybe would have died in that nine-month period. And it was these eight others that they found that were like, that's suspicious. They were not that sick. So like those were the, the ones that they could maybe make stick. Yes. And so gotcha. the, the eight names that I have are Carl Hiltzel, Henry Hansel, Carl Garf, Catherine Piazza, Mrs. Frederick Dre. I don't know what her birth name was. Mrs. Elizabeth Hauser, Henry Horn, and Ferdinand Schultz. May they rest in peace. 
Can we dig into chloroform? Yeah, we can talk about the murder weapon. So this, again, is another example of where rat studies, not the most informative. So the LD50 of chloroform orally administrated to a rat is estimated to be around 0.46 milliliters per kilogram, meaning that for a 150-pound person, it would take roughly 31 milliliters of chloroform orally, so like drinking it to induce death. However, mm. it is known that as little as 10 milliliters of chloroform can actually cause death within minutes, and an air concentration of 700 parts per million is enough to induce death in four hours. For comparison, this level of carbon monoxide in the air would induce unconsciousness in two hours and probably also death in four. And when we're talking about this causing death, this is outside of the like people who are they succumb to chloroform. Yes, yeah, so this is the average. But again, that window can be very wide. Right, but still, so this is the average though. I mean, it sounds potent. It is potent. Yeah, it sounds potent. And because it, it could either kill you or you could survive, but if you survive with an acute exposure, so if, if you become unconscious and not in a way that they want surgically, but you start having other symptoms sure. Sure, 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 and sure. you survive, you can actually start to develop hepatotoxicity in two to five days after exposure to chloroform. And what is that? Hepatotoxicity? Yes. That's liver toxicity, so liver failure. Oh, that's bad. That's yeah. bad. So even if you survive it, you might not survive it. Mm -hmm, exactly. Okay. Gotcha. So what are the signs of extreme exposure, sure. I guess? Like the unintended. Well, as you might guess, it causes central nervous system depression, which is why it induces sedation. You can actually get some excitement, and it's weird because some of the inhalational anesthetics that we have do cause excitement initially. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that brief period of, like, the giddy. Like, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then nausea and vomiting, which are also pretty typical of inhalational anesthetics. And then you can end up with dizziness, drowsiness, and then convulsions and coma, which are obviously, like, the more acute symptoms we don't want. Mm -hmm. Really severe cases can end with paralysis of the medulla medullary respiratory center, leading to respiratory failure and sudden death. And well, that was too much. That was just too much. <laughs> and we're done. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, you can also end up with early death following exposure. So sometimes they would get through the whole surgery and then the patient would still die because of chloroform exposure. Oh. And it could be because of a cardiac arrhythmia. Oh. And shit. chloroform can cause hypotension. And so are all of the symptoms showing up like right after? but some are delayed yes some like are delayed. by the days like mm -hmm. this is a scary one but i do find it interesting maybe because of the deaths that were occurring in those surgeries when there was that big switch right because mm -hmm. i find it interesting that they were able to attribute those cardiac arrhythmia deaths that happened shortly after surgery that they were able to contribute that to chloroform yeah. especially that far back in history right and I think like, that there was a bit of debate about it because I think some of them were like, well, it's more likely to happen in patients who have cardiac things going on. Sure, and it's sure, like, sure. Yeah, but it happens like a disproportionate amount when we use chloroform type thing right. was probably the conversation. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. So do we still use chloroform as a surgical anesthesia today? Not in the United States. No. Okay. But in some other countries that don't have access to the same kind of anesthetics that we do, chloroform is still used. I've read several studies conducted in the last century to assess the safety of chloroform, but no one that I could find was willing to just abandon it altogether and like call out like, hey, no more chloroform use, because it seems like in the event of an emergency or lack of resources, physicians would still be more willing to use chloroform despite the risks of anesthesia because they outweigh the severe pain and trauma that surgery mm -hmm. performed without anesthesia would induce. Sure. I mean, yeah. yeah, those are the hard questions, right? And it sounds like it's more accessible than yeah. others. Well, yeah, because it's still in laboratories around the globe. Like I said, I worked with a lot of chloroform. I don't remember right. if I did it in high school if we had access to it, but like definitely as an undergrad, definitely as a grad student. And then once I got into government labs right. and stuff, like we still used it. Is it easy for Joe Schmo to obtain chloroform? Probably easier than it should be. Okay. Yeah, I that's, think- That's always a question I have with ones that aren't like blatantly obvious. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. Not for people to go get it. Obviously, guys, right. do we need to have the talk again? Anything <laughs> used in this podcast? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Don't do it. I think a lot of the like chemical providers, they put you on a list. And if you're not with an sure. organization, they're like, we won't send you. So they do try to stop it. Okay. But it's like, you can still get it. You can right. still like, get it somehow. Is it something that's like, you have to try a little hard or like, oh yeah, no, you can just like ask for it at the hardware store i don't think you like, can just ask for it at a hardware store i can't think of any use that it has outside of a laboratory gotcha so you have to like order it yeah. through somebody yeah. yeah it's always interesting with these but then people like you were working with it all day every day yeah when i told the doctor that he was like what and i was like yeah i used chloroform <laughs> every day i know what it smells like and he was like what that's scary <laughs> yeah i'm glad you don't do that anymore <laughs> is there any like Anything documented about like chronic long-term exposure? Not that I could find. Like there were okay. chloroform addicts, but I couldn't right. find anything that talked about chronic exposure because it seems like mostly like they had it in surgery and if they survived surgery, you're good to go. Right, or right, right, right. you died in surgery or you died because you right. were being burgled and there was like no in between. So I'm sure that like maybe if I'd done a little bit more searching in like the British Medical Journal at the time, I could have found something. And and now, nowadays, when you go online to like anywhere that deals with addiction, it's not one of the preferred, you know, substances. Sure. Right, well, right. Today. right, 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 right. <laughs> well, and that's, I mean, and that's why like it made me raise my eyebrows and be like, oh, this is like arsenic and that there were chloroform addicts. That's not a thing today. I imagine that it's just like the the huffers of today, like anything gotcha. that you'd see. That, I mean, that's my understanding, probably. It's, I could yeah. be wrong. That makes sense, though. Are there modern cases of people using chloroform to kill somebody? Like, are there people who are working in labs or they find a way to get it? Unfortunately, there are. Yeah. Hmm. We did not leave this in the early 1900s. In 2014, only about 100 years after Frederick Moores was killing people, 34-year-old Samina Imam was killed by the brother of her lover on Christmas Eve using chloroform. Mm. For two years beforehand, Imam had been in a relationship with a man whom she worked with at Costco just outside Coventry, UK. This man, named Roger Cooper, was in a relationship with two other women. Sometime before December of 2014, and mom gave him the ultimatum that he had to leave his longtime girlfriend, who he lived with, to be with her, to be with a mom. Okay. And Cooper agreed, but had absolutely no intention of leaving his girlfriend or his other lover, question mark. I don't know who knew about who, but he was not planning on leaving right. the other two. Instead, he decided to begin plotting to kill a mom. I mean, that's the obvious choice, like the obvious next step. Right. Obviously. Obviously. No. So prosecution at the trial believed that he made such an extreme decision because both Cooper and his mom were managers at Costco. And mm. so he likely believed that if he broke it off with her to spare his long-term relationship, sure. she would reveal that the two were in an affair, which was against Costco company policy. Oh. And he would lose his job as well as his other relationships. Like she would just explode his life. Yeah, I mean, I see where he's coming from. Yeah. He, he's probably not wrong, but also maybe not murder? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but yeah. anyhow. So anyhow. Ro Roger Cooper's accomplice in his crime was his brother, David. For whatever reason, he told David his plan and David was like totally on board with it. The two attempted to kill him on first on December 12th. After a Christmas party, a mom was supposed to head to a local hotel that Roger had booked for her, and he told her that she would find a surprise there. Which is kind of a fucked up thing to say when you're planning to kill her, right? Yeah. So, Roger never actually booked a room, and he and his brother instead planned that David would abduct and then kill Imam before she would enter the hotel. Guys, this is a bad plan. Yeah. You should have let her go into the room where it would have been easy to abduct her. Because abducting somebody in a parking lot, way more risky than in the room. Well, Rookie move. It ended up not happening. The abduction never happened. Well, because, yeah, because that plan's baloney. The next plan, the brothers regrouped, and they decided that Roger would make plans to spend Christmas Day with Imam, which was probably him trying to show, like, a strong indication that he was going to stay with her and he was choosing her, blah, 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 bullshit. And so their plans were to check in at the Mall Mason Hotel in Birmingham on Christmas Eve. They left work after 4 p.m. that evening in separate cars, but then met up, and Roger would drive them both in his car to Birmingham. 
But rather than driving 30 minutes to the west to the hotel, Roger drove the pair 40 minutes to the northeast to his brother David's house in Leicester. Leicester? Leicester. Roger drove the pair 40 minutes to the northeast to his brother David's house in Leicester. He reasoned that it was just a pre-Christmas trip to see his brother, and so and mom had no idea what was going on. She was totally down for this, I guess. She actually spoke to her sister on the phone during this trip and confirmed that she would be visiting with the family, with her family, on the 26th. They arrived at David's house around 5 p.m., and I'm not quite sure the sequence of events after this because David, he did make a confession to the police, but it is riddled with lies to save his own ass. What I can put together is that David was... Again, like they had planned with the abduction scenario, he was the one who had agreed to kill Imam and not Roger, which right. I don't I don't understand why he agreed to that. In his confession, he tries to make a weird claim that Roger left his house, he left David's house, and Imam somehow came back on her own, even though they came in one car. We know that factually. Okay. And David didn't want her to know where he lived, so he used chloroform that he just happened to keep in an ammo case to knock her out. That makes zero sense because we've already no established, sense. like, you don't just have chloroform in your hand. No. It's not bleach. Right. It's not ammonia. Right. And it has to be kept in a dark bottle, typically in the freezer, to avoid oxidizing with air and creating phosgene gas because phosgene gas is a chemical weapon that was used in World War I. Oh, shit. It's extremely fucking toxic. Oh. So this is not a casual thing that just anybody gotcha. has. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. David also admitted to offering Imam tea, which she refused. He mentions this multiple times, that he was, like, trying to placate her with tea, like, Roger will be back, you just, you need to get out of here, do you want some tea, whatever. Ugh. Lies upon lies. Yeah, but I think, yeah. I think there's some truth in this, because the police believe that they administered a mixture of antimony, cadmium, tin, mercury, and arsenic to her in chemical form. So I think this was in her tea. So they're just throwing the whole kitchen sink at it. Yeah. Yeah, like, what? Mm -hmm. These two bumbling idiots, like, who, like, wanted to, like, kill somebody. That's the only thing that I can think about the brother. Like, yeah. I can't get over it. <laughs> and they don't know how to do it. So they're like, okay, instead of doing one of these right, let's just do 12 different poisons. Yeah, let's just do all of them. All it the won't poisons. look suspicious at all if at she has all. all of them in her system. Right. Right. So, again, I'm unsure exactly what the sequence of events is, but right. by 625, Imam was dead. She had been smothered on David's couch, and Roger was headed back to Coventry alone. A fake text was sent from Imam's phone to establish an alibi for Roger, indicating that she somehow left Lester on her own. I think that's how we know that he was traveling back at 625. Oh, okay. David then was responsible for wrapping her body in plastic wrap and a sleeping bag, and then he buried her body in a shallow grave. Her family reported her missing when she didn't show up for their Christmas celebrations, and then the brothers were arrested on suspicion of murder on January 7th, 2015. A week later, a mom's body was finally found. Um, thankfully, this was solved quickly. Fairly quickly, yeah. Yeah, for the family's sake. After an eight-week trial, the brothers were convicted of murder on October 21st, 2015, and both were sentenced to 30 years in prison. At least there was more justice served than in the case of Mr. Moore's. Right, who killed eight people! Right. So, it's something. So yeah, chloroform is apparently still a weapon of choice for some today. Yeah, interesting. And it's one of those that you feel familiar enough with it, yeah. knowing, like, like people at least know what chloroform is. Like, I mean, I thinking about it, it's mostly just used in media mm -hmm. as a tool. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then you wonder, like, where did they get it then? Apparently, these two, the Coopers, they got it off of eBay. Wow. And so I really hope eBay, on the last seven or eight years, has created more stringent policies on selling solvents. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we can help. I do recommend the Poisoner's Handbook, which I mentioned earlier. That's a fun read, and I actually took some information from that for the carbon monoxide episode with Mike Malloy and all that, so. Oh, okay. So yeah. It's, yeah. It's a fun yeah. one. I love Deborah Blum. She's really good. All right. 
And on that note... (laughs) Thank you, Kayla. (laughs) No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like, follow, subscribe, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. For more Lethal Dose content, you can find us at Lethal Dose Pod on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. For an overdose of content, subscribe on Patreon for exclusive episodes and much more. The show theme is Look Far by our dear wizard friend Fogweaver. More of their music can be found on bandcamp.com. Lethal Dose is created, researched, produced, and edited by Kayla Woods and Venus Dineko. Stay safe, and remember, the dose makes the poison.